poor people's lives are battered and diminished in many and various ways. And so if we think of measuring poverty, to be true to their experience and to try to come alongside them, we need to measure those things. Our figures with UNDP sadly identify 1.1 billion people as being poor. Half of them, 566 million people, are children. Your name is itself associated with this new way of measuring poverty, the al qaeda Foster method. What was new about what you developed in this particular way of understanding poverty? There's a problem with just identifying people as poor because you don't know how they are poor in terms of what do I do? What are the indicators that matter? We wanted to create a measure that would give credit for every deprivation of every poor person that went down. Is there one really dominant and pervasive inaccuracy in the way that we are measuring and perceiving poverty? Hello and welcome to Reenchanting, the show that helps you to think through the big issues of our day and ask whether we can reenchant a largely secular culture with the Christian vision of reality. I'm Justin Briley. And I'm Belle Tyndall. And we are joined today by a really special guest, Professor Sabina Alkaya. Mm. Professor Sabina directs the Oxford Poverty and Human Development Initiative at the University of Oxford. And according to the latest statistics, approximately 8.5% of the global population, that's nearly 660 million people, are living in extreme monetary poverty, which is under $2.15 a day. So Professor Sabina has been involved in developing methods of measuring multi-dimensional poverty, and we will find out all about that in this episode, by considering a range of deprivations, such as lack of education or employment, poor health or living standards. And her work is used to address development issues in countries around the world. Yeah, so we're going to be opening up a huge topic today, but... One that I think the interest is added to by the fact that you're ordained in the Anglican Church as well, Sabina. Uh, you're attached to an Oxford parish and a college too. Um, so we'll be exploring, I think, as well as the big issues, how your Christian faith intersects with that and motivates and inspires the work that you do. And, and I suppose in the end, how we can re-enchant, that's the name of the podcast, how we can re-enchant our capacity for compassion, for justice and so on. So welcome along. Thank you so much. So good to be here. So great to have you. And we have so much to talk about, um, but we would be remiss to not start with our signature question. <laughs> a nice little icebreaker of a question, which is, what are you reading at the moment? Well, the books I'm reading at the moment are not the usual kind of books I read, but I oh. just am closing Cave in the Snow by Tenzin Palmo. She was a British woman who became a Buddhist nun in Nepal. And it's about her journey towards that destination and then her years of meditation um, in a hut high in the Himalayan mountains. Wow. The challenges she had and then how she came back out to engage with the community again. And what was the name of the book again? Cave in the Snow. Cave in the Snow. Beautiful. Right. And I'm just starting uh, A Fine Balance by Rohinton Mystery, which has a character portraits of different people, including poor and disadvantaged people, but in a way that is very engaging. Mm. Very human mm. and not at all patronizing. Wow. So Amazing. looking forward to, yeah. to getting a little bit deeper yeah. into that. You say that those aren't your usual books. What are you <laughs> usually reading? Well, just sort of quite, I don't know, more spirituality types of books. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Um, tell us about how you found your way into the position you now hold, sort of looking from a very academic perspective at these big issues of global poverty and so on. What, what, what? inspired that particular journey? I think that there's always been an interest in looking at poverty and that comes out of a faith um, and a desire to somehow be alongside and um, mm. learn from, interact with um, these um, co-workers mm. in a sense. Um, but uh, more academically, I studied medicine, thinking I, pre-med in America, thinking that I'd go into medical school, but I didn't and then moved over into initially theology, but was very interested then in Amartya Sen's work, mm -hmm. who gained a Nobel Prize in economics and who really thought of a framework for looking at poverty and well-being in a way that recognizes both the 
lack of opportunities or capabilities that poor people have, but also recognizes that they have voice, they have vision, they have mm. imagination, creativity, and we need to support their agency to come out of poverty. And so I moved into economics and both did a thesis thinking about how do poor people value development from their eyes. Mm. And that took mm. me to look in, in Pakistan with Oxfam projects of women's income generation mm. and interview the women to find out how did they experience a goat rearing project or a rose garland project or a women's literacy project. Not only what was the economic rate of return and cost benefit mm. analysis that you, you do in your thesis, but also what was their lived experience of those projects. And you find it was much wider. It impacted their friendships. It impacted their hope, yeah. impacted their knowledge. And some of these things actually were as important or more important than the income they gained. So it really opened my mind to really wanting to understand um, mm. these values. Well, I suppose I'm interested in, in where that passion itself came from, if you like. Obviously, it's been channeled in this quite academic direction where you're looking at the, the issues from a big uh, sky, sky high perspective, as it were. But, but where did that sort of interest in eradicating poverty in the first place, I suppose, come from? Was it, was it always there from childhood? Was that something you were actively engaged in from a young age? I wanted to be a vet. Right. But I got allergic to horses <laughs> and then to rabbits. Okay. <laughs> oh. And so then I thought, okay, people. Okay. Yeah. Um, right. But then wanted to be useful. Right. So and, hence thinking of going into medicine. Yeah. But, but. And then as many people do in a, uh, in a summer when I was an mm. undergraduate, took a gap year or a gap summer mm. in Mexico and then saw people in much more difficult circumstances and felt, right. gosh, yes, this yeah. is really um, a place to put one's energy and one's love. Mm. Yes, yeah, so you've sort of alluded to it a little bit, but your research group with the UNDP, um, you release global poverty numbers, but you look at things beyond income. And can you tell us a little about that? Can you tell us what else go into those numbers? What else you're measuring? What else you're seeking out? Yes, again, to quote Amartya Sen, um, yeah. who's been really um, a mentor and an inspiration for this work, he observes that poor people's lives are battered and diminished in many and various ways. And so if we think of measuring poverty, to be true to their experience and to try to come alongside them, mm. we need to measure those things. Mm. So the statistic you cited is the one from the World Bank of extreme monetary poverty, people living less than $2.15 a day. Yeah. But when you talk with poor people, uh, their experience is that but somebody's in, mal undernourished in the household or the roof leaks mm. or mm. a kid can't go to school or they don't have a job mm. or they have to walk a half an hour to get water. And sometimes, actually often, many of these things happen at the same time. So a multidimensional poverty measure looks into the different rooms of people's lives and asks, what are the deprivations that are striking you at the same time? What's your deprivation load? Oh. And it sort of adds these up to figure out who's poor. So with UNDP, we do a measure where we take the same 10 indicators and we ask people across the 110 countries, 6.1 billion people, using data that are representative of those countries, what's in, what's in their lives in terms of deprivations. And it covers 10 deprivations. Is anybody in your household undernourished? Mm. Is, uh, has a child very sadly perished in the last five years? Mm -hmm. um, is a child not attending school up to the age at which they would complete class eight? Is there nobody in the house who's completed six years of schooling of any age, even a child? Mm. Um, do you lack clean water or water that's less than 30 minutes walk round trip? Do you have adequate sanitation that's not shared with other families? Do you have electricity? Do you have housing that's not natural or rudimentary dirt floor, mm. bamboo roof? Mm. Do you have clean cooking fuel? So not wood or dung or charcoal mm. that if you don't have ventilation gets into your eyes mm. and into your lungs mm. and creates acute respiratory infections. And then do you own more than one of a set of small assets like a radio, mm -hmm. a mobile phone or to any telephone, right. yeah. a television, um, a computer, animal cart, motorcycle, bicycle, mm. refrigerator. And if you own a car or truck, you're not deprived in assets. So the measure with UNDP looks at these 10 indicators and for each person it says who's deprived in what. Mm -hmm. And mm. it creates a weighted sum. And if you're deprived in more than one third of the weighted indicators with health and education weighting up to one third, then you're poor. Mm. And our figures with UNDP sadly identify 1.1 billion people as being poor. 
So there's 6.1 billion people we cover, 92% mm. of people living in the developing world, and 1.1 billion are deprived in at least one third of those indicators. Wow. But, Sorry, that's a huge number. And to put that, could you put that in sort of um, in context historically for us? Is that more than, say, 10, 20 years ago? Or what are, where are the numbers going? Well, there's two answers to this question. One is that we don't know in many cases, because okay. still after COVID, we don't have a, a lot of new data sets. Right. Okay. And I'm happy to come back to that. Mm. But there are countries that have a huge progress. So we do trends over time for about five and a half billion people in 81 countries. And in 72 countries, there were statistically significant reductions of poverty, which is great. Mm. Um, in 15 of the countries, the number of poor people went up because it was significant, but the birth rate was higher. Okay. And so the number of poor yeah, people went sure. up, but still it's a positive lesson. There are some challenges because um, of those 1.1 billion poor people, half of them, 566 million people are children. Mm. So they haven't celebrated their 18th birthday. Mm. And in half of our countries, children were being left behind. They either didn't reduce poverty at all or more slowly than adults. So it, even if there's a reduction, you want a reduction that uh, benefits the poorest the most. Mm. And that was challenging to do. Um, but 25 of the countries cut their poverty by half. And so I'll give an example. I could give different examples, but um, one of note is Sierra Leone, a low-income country that we know because of the Ebola crisis. Yeah. And during Ebola, from 2013 to 2017, poverty fell from 74% to 58.3%. It had the fastest reduction of poverty of any country in that time period. Um, and so there was messiness in Ebola. Mm. You know, the mistakes were made. Mm. There was a terrible pandemic going on, mm. but some things went right. And I think that's important to remember because you can reduce acute poverty mm. and it, it's possible even when things are tough. Another example is India. So India has 1.6 billion people, huge country. Um, and in 2005, 655%, 55.1% 55 of people were poor over half of people in India. And by 2019-21, it had come down to 16.4. Right. So from 55% to 16%. And if you cash that out, that's 415 million people coming out of poverty. So 1.1 billion and then 400 million, which would be another mm. 0.4 billion, so, right? Mm. So there have been massive positive right. changes. Gosh. Um, and again, this is a huge question. It might be slightly out of your, your remit, but... What would you say in, in the case of um, Sierra Leone or India were the specific catalysts for making such a big difference in, in you know, these numbers and in terms of poverty? So in both countries, um, each one of the 10 indicators came down significantly, which right. is a good thing. Yeah. Mm. Um, and in India, children reduce poverty faster than adults, which is right. a good thing. The states of India, Bihar, Jharkhand, Madhya Pradesh, Chhattisgarh, that are the poorest, reduce poverty the fastest. Um, the rural areas poorest, reduce poverty the fastest. So it was uh, quite a good uh, subnational right. trajectory. What happened is complex because some programs capture and move several indicators at once. Mm. So India has a well-known midday cooked meal scheme where children get a cooked meal. Mm -hmm. Um, which provides an incentive for them to go to school. Right. Yeah. Um, they also sit with other children. It also gives job to the woman who cooks the mm. food. Um, and so you're hitting undernutrition and you're hitting school attendance and probably some other things mm. just by one mm. program. And that's important because often these integrated programs have a much higher impact. They're more cost effective, as it were, in terms of reducing multidimensional poverty than just one kind of program. Because if I'm deprived in eight things, I can't run around and go to eight programs. Mm. But if there's a program that yeah, hits course. three or four of them at the same time, it's, it's easier for me to take advantage of. That's interesting. Now, your, your name is itself associated with the, this new way of measuring poverty, multidimensional poverty, as it's called the, I believe it's called the al qaeda Foster Method. Do you want to sort of explain what that is? You've already obviously almost been referencing it in, in you know, the statistics you've been explaining here, but, but what, what was new about what you developed in this particular way of understanding poverty? Mm. The name I do find embarrassing. <laughs> you shouldn't, you should <laughs> no. wear it with pride. You know. um, 
But um, James Foster is a very renowned economist who, and mathematician, and he's worked on poverty measurement since he was in graduate school. And as a graduate student in 1984 with Joel Greer and Eric Thorbeck, he published the FGT, Foster Greer Thorbeck Approach to Measuring Monetary Poverty. And it became um, probably one of the most widely used or the most widely used approach to measuring monetary poverty. Mm. And um, I listened to a paper that he gave, having done a lot of work in, in South Asia, and realized that there perhaps was a way to extend his work into multidimensional measures. Mm. And so together, he very kindly came to the UK and spent some time. And so we came up with a very simple measure that stands on the shoulders of others. And we didn't believe that nobody had done it before. <laughs> it's so simple. Mm. But um, basically the idea is that if you know the percentage of people who are poor, that's important. And so mm -hmm. to know mm -hmm. that, you have to set a, a dimensional, uh, some kind of a cutoff. Yeah. Like I mentioned, people who are deprived in one third or more. Um, are poor, and that's a value judgment. Yeah, but it means that you um, you don't have unreasonable numbers. Uh, you don't have a hundred percent of people being poor mm. and zero. Mm. So it's it, it's a it's an intermediary cutoff. But then we also realized that there's a problem with just identifying people as poor because you don't know how they are poor mm. in mm. terms of what do I do? What are the mm. indicators that matter? And also, if you have a person who's like really poor, they're deprived in, let's say, eight things at once, and then two of them change, but they're still poor. Mm. So poverty doesn't go down. Mm. So you don't have any kind of encouragement. Oh. So it has a fancy name, dimensional monotonicity. And we wanted to create a measure that would give credit for every deprivation of every poor person that went down. I see. And it's really simple. So... Um, you look at the deprivation score of a person. So you add up their weighted deprivations. And in the case of the global MPI, all the health and ed education indicators weight one sixth, there are four of them, and the living standards weight one eighteenth. Mm -hmm. So you add up whatever people are deprived in, and that gives a percentage of possible deprivations. And then if it's one third or more, then they're poor. And then you wanna know what's the average deprivation score among the poor. Because if mm. somebody's deprived in 90%, it's much worse than if it's 40%. Mm. But you add it up and you take the, the average. We call that mm. intensity. It's showing mm. on average mm. how many things are going wrong at the same time. Yeah. And then it actually is really simple. Astonishingly simple. But you multiply the percentage of people who are poor by the average intensity of poor people. Mm. And you get a number that is an index that goes from zero to one. But the important thing for people who care about poverty is that you can break it down to look at exactly what are the deprivations poor people are facing, how many poor people are deprived in nutrition, how many poor people mm. are deprived in this, where do they live, what's their age. But also if you are in political office and you reduce the number of children out of school, it'll be years before those children grow up, get a job, monetary poverty comes down. Mm. But if school attendance is in the MPI, every single child that goes into school reduces the MPI right. that period. Yeah. And so to try to give credit, but also incentives, recognition, yeah. yes. get, get some positive yes. energies going towards poverty reduction. Because in, in a sense, I, I can imagine if we were only measuring poverty by pure income, then it, it might be that everyone feels impelled to channel everything into that, but that doesn't actually address the whole problem, obviously. And, and you want to take a holistic approach, which obviously the, the multidimensional uh, approach takes. And this, it sounds like this has been adopted very widely by international governments and so on. Is, is it now the sort of a, the de facto way of understanding poverty, would you say? Monetary poverty is still important. Right. So you need both because mm. you still want money. Yeah. You want to be able to just, you know, Poor people also speak about how much they value even just buying lipstick, but having some mm. freedom mm. to do the things they want to do. Yeah. Uh, but also monetary poverty does a lot uh, in terms of core poverty, material to poverty reduction. So we think of it as a complement, as a sister measure. Uh, Mexico was the first government to launch a multidimensional poverty measure um, in 2009. And then Bhutan, the little country between China and India mm. in 2010. Then Colombia in 2011. And now we have a South-South network 
um, which contain 63 countries, and around two thirds of them have official permanent statistics on multidimensional poverty, and many others are developing them. And it's in the sustainable development goals. And so I think that it's, it's quite intuitive, even here in this country, that it's not only money that matters, mm. but money still matters. Mm, sure. mm. But also you can't buy a better school. You can't buy mm. things that aren't existing in the society. So you also need these other kinds of benefits mm. to be available. Something that's in the 2022 report is this, um, this phrase deprivation bundles. Mm. Can you talk us through those, um, what those are and what you've found by seeking them out and measuring those? Yes. So when you think of poor people, and this is whether you are in the village in fieldwork, uh, if you live in these communities or if you look at data, okay. then you recognize that most people have several deprivations going on at the same time. Mm -hmm. For example, 444 million people lack electricity just to give, and are multidimensionally mm. poor. Mm -hmm. But 99% of the people who lack electricity have other deprivations right. at the same time. Um, and so a deprivation bundle is, the set, is a set of deprivations. Mm. For example, half of the poor people lack elect, uh, nutrition and housing. Um, and another common uh, bundle is cooking fuel and electricity. So many people cook with solid mm. cooking fuel, they don't have electricity, mm. they can't turn on um, a, a lamp when night falls. Mm. And so you want to look at these bundles um, because they walk together. But there's some interesting things. So the most common deprivation bundle across the 1.1 billion poor people is nutrition, housing, sanitation, and cooking fuel. Oh, okay. And you might not expect that mm. because nutrition is something different mm. than housing, sanitation, yeah. cooking fuel. Yeah. And so these are housing material things, but then nutrition alongside. That's most common in the world. Mm. And the next most common is all of the living standard indicators at the same time. Right. And, and these vary by region. They vary by, um, yeah, climate. And so really trying to understand this is important, as I said, because money is limited. Mm. You want to have the biggest impact on poverty with limited money. Mm. And so you need to know what are the packages of deprivations that you yeah. can address together. Yeah. yeah. And so that you have really the biggest impact in empowering poor people that you can with with the funds that are available. So I suppose you, you spend a lot of time sort of at this level kind of investigating, analyzing, statistically measuring, if you like, these different indices of poverty and so on. Um, but your work does take you, as it were, to the front line as well. I know that you spend a lot of time, you know, almost up to half of your time is spent traveling and, and so on. What What what, what kind of are you learning as you kind of go into a place rather than simply sort of being in the office and, and reading graphs and reports and so on? What, what, what difference does it make to actually be there on the ground in places where people are experiencing this kind of multidimensional poverty? It makes a huge difference because they are the experts, mm. as it were. Mm. And so often we work with national statistics offices and um, so they will want to make an official poverty measure. And we'll look at the data sets together. We might uh, make some candidate measures, analyze them. And then we'll go together um, to different spots and thinking very carefully to make sure we touch on different groups of the population. So we learn from different ones. Mm. And we'll first have open-ended questions and just listen and say, you know, what are the... Poverty is sometimes the wrong word. Yeah. So you need a word that conveys dignity, respect, yeah. mm -hmm. but also recognizes that ill-being and things that hurt matter. And so find the right word, the language, the method that makes people comfortable. Um, but then listen, okay, well, what are the challenges that you are facing? Mm. And you have to also think of who's in the room. Sometimes you have to interview men and women separately or rich and poor people separately or different generations separately. Right. So you, a lot is behind the scene. Mm. Um, but then having done an open-ended and, and just tried to listen keenly, then if they have a candidate measure, then we'll prepare a very short questionnaire. And we'll see if people are willing to, to answer it. Mm. And then that night we'll analyze it. And we'll say, according to the candidate measure we made in the capital city, who in this village would be poor? And if they're patient enough with us in the morning, they'll come back mm. and we'll show them. And they'll say, no, 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 that's wrong. Mm. This is wrong. She's not poor. He is. Mm. And then we'll say, why? Mm. 
And that's when you learn so much yeah. about really what matters, about inaccuracies of measurement, about um, understandings of poverty. And it's those conversations where they're done with a, a good sample mm. of different communities that can really sharpen your work. Because at the end of the day, yes, you have to meet national or international objectives. But if there isn't a, a connection to what poor people in communities feel are their priorities, mm. then there's something wrong. Mm. Mm. And Amartya Sen uh, has a beautiful expression that we want to expand the capabilities people value and have reason to value. So in the capital city, you have reason to value this or that, mm. but is it actually valued? And so mm. the participatory work, in a sense, helps us to check that out. And I think it also is inspiring at a personal level. Yeah. Yeah. Because you see people in very difficult circumstances who are radiant mm. and who have a depth of um, courage. Um, they have a philosophy. They're able to get through things and still come out the other side. Often they have a, a, a intensity of faith practice. It's really beautiful. Yeah. Mm. And so I think just appreciating that is also part of this work, that you remember that, mm. yes, there's some tragedies, many tragedies, but there's also a lot of beautiful, imaginative, creative energies. Mm. Yeah. Is there a, you spoke about, and that's a fascinating process where um, the inaccuracies that you go back with the next morning, is, is there one that stands out to you, whether it's because it's surprising or because it's really dominant and pervasive, an inaccuracy in the way that we are measuring and perceiving poverty? So an inaccuracy, um, often we look at land and livestock, right? Okay. Because if you have a cow, you know, that's fantastic, right? Because right. you can right. get milk, mm. you can get babies, you mm. know, you can sell the calves. And so I was in Bhutan um, in this exercise and we did the thing. We came back the next morning. A man was not poor because he had a cow. And he, the man was in the room actually. And he said, yes, but the cow is my friend. I lost my wife. Wow. And she's too old to give milk, mm. but she's my companion. Right. And there are other examples from other communities of times where you can't fix that as a measurement person. I can't fix that. Mm. So you just have to say there's limits to what I can do. Mm. Okay. Um, other things that they do, for example, in Kenya, in an urban area, they brought our attention to charcoal and other places to kerosene and the kerosene fumes and the risk of fire. And so they've, you know, changed some of the definitions of, of cooking fuel that are appropriate in different contexts. Mm -hmm. Another place, um, uh, the flooding from the river hit them. And so they actually said, this is what makes our life miserable is that every year our houses are flooded. Mm. And this is what happened. This is what's in the water that comes into our houses, which we don't want to know. Oh. Um, and so that came into the measure. Another place in El Salvador, uh, UNDP supported a long two-year participatory exercise. And the government had said poverty was health, education, and living standard. But they said, there's two other things you've missed. One is violence and one is esparcimiento, which is places for my children to play, for the old people to drink coffee, for the lovers to walk arm in arm. Okay, yeah. And at that time, El Salvador was the murder capital of the world. You know, in terms of the homicide rate, it was terribly high. But the government said, that's not poverty. But the woman's, mm. it, they, they said, only God can protect us here. We come in at three o'clock, you know. Mm. It was so such a pervasive part of their life. And mm -hmm. so then there had to be a discussion, but in the end, a measure that included violence was released. And so I think, again, each place is different. Mm. What comes up, sometimes it's the rhinoceros in the forest that make your jobs dangerous. But, you, you know, listening to what is really at play is a really important part of tweaking statistics mm. and then trying to figure out what you can do in very imperfect measures to get it better. Yeah. Mm. So, mm. so in that sense... The index for what counts as poverty, say here in the UK, might be very different to another part of the world at some level. I mean, in that sense, can we even use the word poverty, you know, as, as a catch-all? Because there are such different forms of poverty, ultimately, aren't there? Um, I, I mean, and, and I suppose my, my bigger question is, is it, is it getting better? I suppose, presumably compared to, say, 100 years ago, 200 years ago, absolute poverty, there is less of it in the world today. But by the same measure, I've heard it said at least that someone can feel their poverty more when they're exposed to someone who is not experiencing that poverty next to them. So the fact that 
you do live in the ghetto and then there, there is someone who is in a, you know, a, a swanky apartment only a mile away makes it different to say when everyone was experiencing the same measure of kind of poverty because they didn't think of it in quite the same way as we do today when we, we have the haves and have nots. I don't know whether that's a question makes sense, but is, is there a sense in which all these factors make a difference to how people conceive of, of the poverty that they might actually be experiencing? There is. There's a long uh, discussion in the poverty measurement about what, uh, what constitutes poverty. Um, Adam Smith observed that in 18th century Scotland, you needed leather shoes and a linen shirt. Right. And that would not have been the case in another place, but that was to go about without shame. Mm. And so clearly as countries develop, they need different standards. And now many countries, as I mentioned, have national measures and these are tailor-made. So Sierra Leone's, of course, is going to be very different than uh, South Africa's. Mm -hmm or um, India's, or Armenia, or the United States. And each need to be tailored to the data sets that they have and to their context and the expectations to some extent, and also the, the policy priorities. And so whether it's the cutoffs, like six years of schooling would not be the right cutoff in a, a developed country, a uh, more, more developed country or a higher human development country. So they might use 10 or 12 years of schooling. Um, but then additional indicators come in. In many places, they'll have employment or they'll have, um, some have environmental variables, some have social protection, some have um, gendered aspects. Uh, mm. So I think every context will have its own measure. And that's important because in the global multidimensional poverty measure uses the same cookie cutters for everybody. And that has a value because you can compare mm -hmm. um, South Sudan or Niger. Niger has 89% of people poor, but Seychelles has zero, you know. Right. And so you see the whole gamut right. of experiences. And that's, that's useful. But then in terms of government action, you need a measure that's appropriate for your country. And so, and is it going down? I think each country has their own trajectory, but they're tracked now in the sustainable development goals. And an interesting example is Colombia. Um, Colombia was the third country to launch a measure. And it was launched by Juan Manuel Santos, who was the president of the Republic of Colombia at the time. And he was president for two terms until 2018. And now it's the third government. There was one after and then the Petro government currently. And they've been really leaders in using multidimensional poverty measures for policy. Mm. So in the first governments of President Santos, it was in the, during the peak the move towards peace. Mm. And he recognized that you can't have peace if you don't address poverty. And so that became a central platform. Mm. And after they signed the peace accord in 2016, when he got the Nobel Peace Prize, then uh, the MPI was part of the Havana Accord. So concern for the communities that had been under FARC control, concern for the ex-combatants that they'd not fall into poverty, concern for the victims of violence that they have support. Mm. Um, the victims had been supported throughout, but um, it's, it's important to sort of realize that a priority of poverty goes alongside other mm. priorities a government might have. Um, and in those eight years, poverty went down from roughly 30% to roughly 20% right. um, and continued to go down. So there are many country examples that we learn from um, in terms of how they did it by targeting, by budget allocation, by mm. policy design, by engaging private sector, et cetera. Mm. Mm. What are some of the greatest challenges that you are facing currently in multi-dimensional measurement? So at the global level, there's a big problem with data. Okay. So if you go to Forbes.com, uh, you find data on billionaires every hour, mm. what they're worth. Um, our poorest country this year is Niger. Uh, we had to drop South Sudan and Burkina Faso this year because they didn't have new data from 2010. Mm. Niger's data dates to 2012. Wow. Uh, we'll drop it next year. So um, these are the poorest countries in the world. Mm. And yet there's not up-to-date data. Not every hour, not every year, not every five years, not every 10 years. So I think that's a concern mm. because yeah. what you want to do in reducing poverty is it's a team sport. Mm. You have to play, you have to play together, you have to play to win. But if you are in an information vacuum, 
you don't know if you're making a difference. Mm -hmm. And so to continue to motivate people to know where to allocate your money, mm -hmm. to know where programming is working, where you need to adjust, you need this feedback. And data is, in a sense, one mechanism of doing that. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's a challenge. Yeah. And it hasn't gotten better after the pandemic. And another one is, um, you know, having, uh, I think, a way of understanding and addressing poverty across different political administrations. So multidimensional poverty is a new kid on the block. Right. And we want two things that are inconsistent. We want people who are in positions of power to take this seriously and to fight poverty with passion. Mm. But then when there are elections, sometimes the next government, if it is not them, might want to dislodge anything that was done passionately yeah. by the previous mm. government. Okay. Yeah. And yet you want them also to fight poverty with passion and mm. with a different kind of creativity. Mm. Mm. And so trying to bring poverty metrics that are permanent. So the question is not what will we measure, but how will we fight it? Mm. And how will we do better than our previous mm. um, person in terms of reducing it? I think getting that right is something we need to, to do a little bit better at. I guess we can hope that every government, if it's elected to serve the people, will have a passion for eradicating poverty. I just wonder, at a, at a, I suppose, more ground level, do you find that that instinct you had from childhood to want to help, to that, that compassion instinct, if you like, is that still going strong in the West or... I don't know, is it, is it harder to find that compassion instinct? I, I think back to, I suppose, when, you know, images were broadcast around the world of the Ethiopian famine in the 1980s and so on, and suddenly there was this outpouring of concern and, you know, you had Live Aid and you had all those sorts of things happen. But now that I think people are so used to seeing images on their screens of poverty, whether it's bred a certain kind of compassion fatigue or whatever we call it these days. Is there still, is there still a, a, a passion that you encounter at least, you know, in people to, to want to eradicate poverty, to feel like, no, this can be done and we should be doing this. This is what we should be pouring our lives into. My fear is we've turned into a slightly more selfish culture in recent years. Um, people are a bit more concerned about making sure I... I get, you know, my goals sorted and, you know, and maybe at some point down the line, I'll worry about other people. I, I don't know. What, what's your feeling on that? I know it's a very subjective question in a, in a sense, Sabina. Yeah. Um, there's a, a beautiful quote by Amartya Sen ages ago, now with Jean Dres in 1989, Hunger in Public Action. And he objects that people have become coolly accustomed to aspects of hunger and mm. poverty. And he identifies two reasons for that. One is we think that not a lot can be done. And the other is we say, well, it's not a problem for which I am responsible. Mm. And I think those two arguments still are there. And so I think that one way of inviting engagement is first to show that a lot can be done, to give the positive stories. I mentioned Sierra Leone, India, Colombia. I could have mentioned Indonesia or Cambodia. Um, Haiti had a good period um, Togo, Mauritania, like Li Libya, you know, so there are many good stories mm, mm, where people mm. um, have reduced poverty very strongly. Mm. And I think showing that and showing the changes, not just in measurement, which we do, but holding hands with people who show the changes with lives or, you know, it, that that can be, I think something can be done yeah. and it can be done quite easily um, and rapidly and it does have lasting impacts. And I think the other question is, is it something for which we are responsible? And underlying that is, a, I think, a fear, a fear of feeling guilty. Mm. But I think actually there's joy and there's a sense of accomplishment and solidarity if people join together in the work. Mm. And um, so it, just changing that narrative a bit mm. can be useful. I mean, there's a, certainly a role for recognizing the terrible things that we, different countries, different eras have done that has exacerbated poverty, indignity, um, terrible conditions, and that needs to be confronted and, and held responsible. But I think there's also um, some way of exploring an appropriate um, respect and working together mm. that um, is very important. And I, we have to remember that 
most of poverty reduction is not something anyone else can do. So the World Bank did a massive study called Moving Out of Poverty, and it studied thousands and thousands of people who had moved out of poverty, and it interviewed them. Mm. And one question it asked is, who was responsible for your exit from poverty? Was it a government? Uh, was it an NGO? Was it a faith community? Was it your kin, your family? Um, was it some uh, international donor? Or was it, you know, your own initiative? And 77% said, actually, it was my own initiative. Mm. There were other things out there, mm. but I had to put the pieces together. Mm. I had to get up in the morning and have the courage to do it. When I fell and when I failed, I had to get up again and try again. And I think also there's a, a kind of paternalism, which is often criticized in development assistance. But I think recognizing that the real agents are the, the men, women, and children who are mm. sort of on the ground, on the front mm. line. And our job is to support, empower, uh, be alongside them yeah. in different ways. And it depends where we are, how we do that. I think that's an important check. Yeah. But it's also a liberating check yeah. because then you're part of a community. It's not mm. lots of need, mm. um, but it's people with mm. imagination, creativity, agency who happen to be poor at the moment, but mm. they also have a lot to teach us and yeah. do us. Yeah, that's, that seems like a real um, positive byproduct of measuring poverty the way you do. Mm. Um, have you, as well as that, um, the first part of the problem, which is this is too big of a story, have you found that measuring poverty in a multi-dimensional way has that helped that because actually it can be broken down into um well when it's broken down does it feel like just less of this big sort of just one name disaster if you know what i mean has that been something beneficial that has flowed from the work that you've been able to do yes i think it makes it more concrete sure. and you can focus on what to do but also we as a research group it's not like we only write about this and never try to understand the faces behind the numbers. Mm. So we also each year with the Global Multidimensional Poverty Index, you know, release one, but we'll do a number of case studies of people who live these experiences. Mm. And so this year it was um, a Bangladeshi woman, Deepa, from an island actually in Bangladesh, who lives with her husband and daughter and granddaughter. Um, and they have an undernutrition in the family, but they're educated, um, but they lack everything except electricity. So they lack clean water because the water is like 40 minutes uphill and she's 70 years old. Mm. She's getting arthritis. It's hard to get the water. Um, they don't have sanitation. Um, their house, you know, is, is very rudimentary. Um, they, she doesn't even have a mobile phone, no assets at all. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, you know, in terms, technical terms, her deprivation score is 40%. But getting to know her, her hopes, her fears for her child who's disabled but fantastic in school, they want her to go to university. Mm -hmm. um, it's just, it, it humanizes it. Mm -hmm. And I think it also um, is really important to balance the numbers with mm -hmm. a, a sense of the people behind the numbers yeah. and to do that regularly. Um, and it also, I mean, we're silly because we're geeks. And so sometimes numbers will come back on our computers and we'll be like this because we numbers are the language we speak. Right. You know, so we see yeah. the human stories when we see these horrible yeah. numbers, yeah. but not everybody does. Sure. And mm. so you need to also to show, show the faces. And it's fun. Uh, some of our students also have done that. And when one student was in Uganda um, and uh, the family that he interviewed, they danced at night with the mm. radio of a neighbor. Mm. And so dancing with them and learning yeah. um, was, you know, just very beautiful because even though he was from the country, he hadn't gone that part of it. Mm. So um, it's interesting. I mean, you, you, you sort of quite aside from the work you do specifically through the, um, Oxford Poverty and Human Development Initiative, you, you are a pastor in a sense, um, by the fact that you're ordained. Um, we could have called you the Reverend Professor Sabina Alcar, I suppose. Just call me but, Sabina. <laughs> but the, I suppose I'm just fascinated by, you know, how that sits alongside what you do. Uh, firstly, could you just briefly tell us the story of, of why you, you know, became a uh, ordained in, in the Anglican Church? The nerve, that question always makes me a bit nervous because I don't have a, a beautiful story of God's call. Um, I think maybe I'm an encouraging example to people who walk backwards um, and don't have a lot of clarity. But I think that I did have 
a desire to continue to work on poverty mm. and through a period of circumstances that got shaped into a diaconal ministry. So I was ordained deacon and wanted to be permanent deacon because the role of a deacon is to bring the needs of the world, mm. the church. And that was something I felt really, you know, cohered with, with my vocation. Um, and then later on, because of the community around me, um, it was discerned that I would go forward for the priesthood. Um, but it wasn't that I sort of got a message from God saying, this is what you want, I want you to do. And I felt quite self-conscious because I thought it was presumptuous to say, I, I feel called to be a priest because I didn't really have a feeling in right. that way. But the community around me discerned and suggested it. And so I, because I can't see, I sort of trusted them. If you don't mind me saying, I think that's probably the best kind of calling you can have when the people around you discern it on your behalf almost, because I, I and you're, 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 you know, you, you speak with great humility when you, you're obviously someone who's done some pretty amazing things, Sabina, but has that, I suppose, unique vocation helped you kind of, has it fed into what you do on an, obviously on a more academic level, being sort of ordained in, you know, and, and being on the ground with people in that kind of sense at a spiritual and pastoral level? I suppose it does give you some, some insight into the, the bigger issues that you're dealing with as, as an academic? Mm. I mean, for me, it, to this day, it feels a huge privilege to be alongside people in that way. Um, and certainly the current, the roots, the only purpose of my life is, is to try to, uh, in a very, very small and humble way, to be part of the body of Christ, um, serving each other. Mm. And uh, so that's my prayer every morning. That's, uh, and certainly being ordained, you have a rhythm of prayer, you have a community. Mm. Um, to either pray with or discuss, talk with. And so that's been a, a real gift. Um, and also you get to know people in different ways. And even though I'm not, um, it is very different to be in a parish in this country mm. than it is in terms of the work that I do. But it's, it's a lovely balance. Yeah. Um, mm. That's it. It's really, um, I can draw like a direct line between your Christian faith and the work you do with um, multidimensional poverty measurement. It makes complete sense how one led you to the other. I'm really interested though, has the work you've done um, in the realm of multidimensional poverty and the people you've met, how has that fed back into your understanding of God's goodness, um, of, his, and of your understanding of your own faith and sort of has the... Have they shaped each other? Is it a vice versa situation? Very much so. Mm. Um, I think, first of all, in some of the work, there's a lot of distress and pain yeah. and questions that come up. And um, so a lot of sort of calling on the Lord for understanding or for presence or mm. intercession or why. <laughs> yeah. So a lot of those questions come yeah. up. And But another is that, um, at the end of the day, you have to find a way of managing the stress and managing the things you see or you burn out. Mm. And when you can give it over to the one who has suffered mm. and is alongside, um, when you can give it to the faith and say that, so as a Christian, I can articulate it one way, others in other faiths would articulate it differently, but that at the end of the day, God will wipe away all the tears. Mm. You know, and that this is um, the work of one who's greater than I, who's holy and who has answers I don't. And so my prayer is just to be part of a work I hardly understand, mm. um, of the sort of the bringing together the redemption in, in this life as well as beyond. Um, I, I sometimes wonder if that's why you do see so often people of faith represented so much in this type of work. Because I can imagine it is very easy to get burned out if you don't have something to turn to, if you don't have someone to hand it over to. Because mm. it, you know, from where I'm standing, it, it could look like an insurmountable task if you, if you don't believe there's any ultimate justice in the world, any ultimate solution or a God behind it all. Um, even though that presents its own challenges, as you say, because you know, you, you, it raises that age-old question of, of why is the world like this if there's a God in charge of it. But at the same time, I can imagine not having those spiritual resources could make that job very difficult actually, because you, you don't have anywhere to turn in that sense. Yeah. In a sense, you're holding hands across the centuries. So you have mother trees and my work is a drop in the ocean, but if mm. a drop were not there, it would be missed down to mm. the fourth century, you know, Gregory of Nyancius or whatever. Um, and so you can read how they confronted the famines of their time and how they 
uh, dealt with these mm. issues and you just felt feel a sense of community um, by by learning from them mm. in a sense. I, I, I've been fascinated, just happened to have been doing some reading just recently on the way in which people like Gregory of Nyssa and others really started to universalize that sense of our duty to the poor, mm. you know, which I think a lot of people don't realize really didn't exist in the ancient world. There, there, there might have been forms of charity, but, but certainly there wasn't any sense that people were obliged to give their lives for the poor. That was really something that I think, to a large extent, Christianity began to universalize. Um, and in a sense, you, you, you stand in that tradition. Um, I, I sometimes wonder in, in our, you know, this podcast is called Reenchanting, whether in our somewhat disenchanted world, whether we're in danger of losing that sense that actually we all have an obligation to the poor. Because if we are living in a purely material universe, that is a, essentially a theological assumption, you know, and not everyone maybe thinks that way in an in a increasingly post-Christian age. I don't know if you have thoughts on, on that. Not probably very interesting thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us yeah. your uninteresting thoughts. On it, <laughs> I, I, just, I just wonder, I suppose it's linked to my question of whether we're, we're moving into an age where people are, are less prone to think that they have an obligation to, to help the poor. I don't know, because what's very clear is that there, there is a growing consternation about the state of the environment. Mm. And part of that is also how these climate crises are striking mm. the poor and vulnerable. Mm. And it's not couched perhaps in faith terms or in duty terms, but I think the law of God is written in our hearts, in, as it says in Romans. And so I think, I, I, I don't know. I think would be the, the closest answer. I do know that in the work that we do um, across many countries, many of our counterparts would be people of faith, mm. Muslim, Christian, Buddhist, Hindu, um, and that there's a commonality there. And that's quite interesting, but not all. Mm. And so mm. I don't think that faith is in any sense a prerequisite. Right. Um, and many people who work at the UN, fantastically on the front line of some of these might be there out of a humanitarian purpose or a different purpose. Um, but I think that, as Gandhi said, when people were asking, a doctor came to him who was an atheist and said, can I join? Um, I don't have a faith. And Gandhi said, well, do you believe in the end that good will overcome evil? And he said, yes, I do. And Gandhi said, well, that, that's what you need. That kind of orientation will mm -hmm. give you the strength you need, mm -hmm. um, particularly in a nonviolent situation, which, which could be quite dangerous. I, I, and I'd be tempted to say that is a form of faith, mm. believing that ultimately good will triumph. Yeah. You know, if, if we do live in a purely purposeless universe, there's no reason to assume that, mm. you know, at, at a sort of metaphysical level. So I think everyone, if they go in with that kind of assumption, even if they don't think of themselves as being religious, there's a sort of a faith of some sort going on in the mm. background, maybe. Mm. Just my thoughts anyway. Because you're an apologist. Through it is. Through, it's I my think. apologetic side coming out of me, I'm afraid. <laughs> I am. Um, that being said, is there anything that you think, and I know that aid is not, you know, your thing as much as measurement is, but is there anything that, um, any gap that the church in particular can stand in, if you know what I mean? Is there anything that specifically the church, you know, as, as varied as it is, um, can do? Mm. It's difficult to, for me because I, I'm sure the church is doing so much that I don't know. And of course, in many, many of the countries, yeah. it's very active. Yeah. Um, on the international stage, perhaps it doesn't have so much of a voice. So in my world of poverty measurement, it's, it's really not yeah, there. Yeah, that's interesting. It, the Islamic Development Bank very much is. Um, oh, right. Other faith actors are. Um, but I think there are two things. One is coming back to President Santos, um, but I could also give an example in Costa Rica. When he was president, he invited some CEOs who were his friends um, to come to the field. So they went to Cartagena. They went to a very, very poor community. And they donned the, the um, uniform of the social workers that would go door to door and find out about the poor people. And so they became enumerators for a day, which is a phrase that means that they went and asked people mm. questions. and. They came back that night and it was a very impactful experience because most of them didn't realize that people lived like that in their country. Mm. And that exposure, in a sense, changed their hearts, changed mm. their 
willingness as CEOs of powerful corporations to think of ways to contribute. Mm. A similar thing happened in Costa Rica, where the CEO of the biggest bank um, went into a, a, a poor area in his capital city. And again, he didn't think that people right. lived like that right. in Costa Rica, which is a fantastic mm. country mm. known for mm. peace, known mm. for the environment, mm. known for all of these things. And so he said, well, are my employees, are any of my employees living like that? So he started to do a survey on the employees of the national poverty measure, multidimensional poverty measure, starting with himself. And at that point, 14% of people in Costa Rica were poor. And to his shock, he found that 12% of people in his company were poor. Mm. And they weren't just the sweepers and the cleaners, mm. but it was also up to middle managers because they had both sets of parents, they had unemployed kids. And so if you looked at their household, their wider mm -hmm. community, then they were really in difficult places. And so then he and now many uh, businesses in Costa Rica are looking at their empl own employees or their value chains and thinking about how to support this very close domain. Mm -hmm. And it increases uh, morale in terms of the staff, lo lower absenteeism, you know, higher staff retention. So they're good benefits instrumentally, but I think it was driven from a, a heart connection. Mm -hmm. it, at some point, I know German bishops went to the field and they had a grassroots immersion program. Mm. Um, and I don't know if the churches are doing that kind of thing now, but it would be interesting. It's sort of a, a role to um, connect worlds. Yeah. And mm. so that there can be a change of perspective and we don't know what creativity, imagination, new ideas will come out. But I think where that connection is made um, mm -hmm. in a way that's appropriate and safe and not poverty tourism, mm. but really yeah, yeah. learning and observing a fellow mm. human being, then that can be, I think, yeah. uh, an interesting moment because in our world, it's so easy to divide ourselves and distance ourselves from other people. It is. And, and what you're describing there of those CEOs going and actually just meeting people who were not like them getting out of their bubble, I think that's just something that everyone would benefit from. You know, when, when I think of the fact that I, it, you know, you always are in the, the danger of obviously it becoming paternalistic or, um, you know, poverty tourism and all the rest of it. But I, I do think there's a genuine, if you just get people out of their bubble and show them how other people live in the world, it can just change a heart, you know, mm. and it doesn't mean that it changes the situation, but, but that's the beginning of something very often. I mean, st sticking with churches making a difference the big campaign I think of when I think of, you know, the last time I remember there being a really big campaign that churches were sort of quite front and centre in was the Make Poverty History campaign, sort of mid-2000s, very much, I think, linked to the Millennium Development Goals and so on. Um, firstly, do you think that campaign did make a difference? And if so, what was it? And do you think we need something like that, something that's as visible as that was? I, I, I can't think of anything in recent years that, that has had the same kind of public sort of awareness and impact that, that the Make Poverty History campaign did. Yes, I remember in London, they wrapped a white band around St. Paul's That's Cathedral, right. mm. Make Poverty History, and had a big event there with many of the speakers, Gordon Brown, Bono, mm. etc. Um, and there was in the United States church, there was a big general uh, in their mm. annual event, uh, several years running, there were big U2 careerists and things. Yeah. Mm. And I think that that's, it's valuable because on the one hand, it shares information. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, it shows this generation that the church is at the cutting edge, um, as it were, of, of these issues, that there's a, a scale of concern and appropriation, which I think is more visible at the moment in terms of the climate than perhaps in, of poverty. Um, and it would be, I think, very useful mm -hmm. to think of it again, because it, it, it does matter at, at a number of different levels. Um, in a sense, many of the changes require deep roots, mm. deep roots in communities, deep roots of people who've been aware of issues for a while uh, in terms of knowing where to give their funds or uh, donations, in terms of understanding how to advocate to their political leaders, but also in terms of knowing what they can change. Mm. Um, and so it would be, I think it requires more crafting mm. than the MDG campaign, Make Poverty History, because there's not a moment like that in the SDGs. But I, it could be uh, a way to find a voice and an appropriate articulation of a, a commitment which is nascent, but perhaps a bit muted or not mm. held so publicly. Mm. And I think it would actually be quite appealing um, to many people 
were that to happen, but I, I don't know how it would yes. start. Mm. Yeah. I suppose that's where we need, you know, the people who sort of are in a position to, to kind of create those kinds of campaigns and to kind of tap into the, mm. yes, certainly to, to work closely with what you do, but where they can sort of have those, that kind of a vision for, the, for something that will actually empower people to, to actually feel like they can make a difference, as, as I think that campaign sort of did in, in its way. Um, I, I suppose in a sense, we can't just live from campaign to campaign, but we need something that obviously is, is ongoing work throughout. But then these moments where it just become, it is highlighted can be helpful as well, can't they? And just putting it in the foreground for people. I remember when Jim Wolfenson was president of the World Bank, there was a faith group at the World Bank at the time. And he observed when he met with faith leaders um, that you know who the poor people are. You know their addresses. You know their family histories. You're there year in and year out. You're not just there for one program for three mm, years. Mm. Um, but the faith communities throughout the world, in a sense, also have an ongoing set of activities which perhaps are not given visibility and sometimes feel a bit forgotten. Mm. And so I think if there were a way to affirm the existing activities and bring them together and crystallize mm. and say, this is what's already happening, mm. um, which many people may not realize. And then also, you know, the, the need and the possibility of, of consolidating them or going the step further. That would be very positive. Mm. Mm. Bina, I've learned so much. <laughs> I've learned so much. This has been such a rich hour of conversation. Um, yeah. And I've just learned so much. Yeah. So Thank you. Thank you for joining us for this hour. Thank you for talking us through multidimensional poverty measurement. Um, it's been invaluable talking to you. Thank you. If people wanted to find out more, um, where, where would you suggest they begin, Sabina? So the website of our research group is ophi.org.uk uh, for OFI, Oxford Poverty and Human Development Initiative. Um, it's mirrored on the UNDP Human Development Report site. Um, and then it has links out to other work um, and to the network, uh, the Multidimensional Poverty Peer Network, mppn.org. So those would have most of the uh, links to the national reports, to talks at the UN General mm -hmm. Assembly by different political leaders on poverty. And it's really worth watching them because sometimes we can think that politicians are a particular kind of person. But mm -hmm. when you see some of these people talk, you know, with complete conviction mm -hmm. on issues of mm -hmm. poverty, it's encouraging mm. restores your faith that, yeah. that there are really people who care mm. thank you so much we'll make sure there are some links to the links you've just mentioned from today's show but for now thank you so much for being our guest thank you